Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. As I upload this, we are currently just a few days away from the one-year anniversary of No Time to Die. You remember the Bond film that got postponed time and time again, the wait was agonizing and endless, and then it finally came out and it proved to be the most divisive Bond film to ever be released? That one. Well, I think that a year's anniversary is a good excuse to reflect on the film again. With every Bond film that I've seen at the cinema, barring Skyfall, which I loved from the moment I saw it, every other film I've had ups and downs with. When I first saw Casino Royale in 2006, I came out of the cinema like, oh wow, that was different, not sure how I feel about that, and now it's one of my very favourites in the entire series, whereas I came out of Quantum of Solace feeling like it was a good mid-tier Bond film, and now it's my least favourite film in the whole series. I guess it can just take a little bit of time to become used to the film, and for the honeymoon period to wear off, there's always a different kind of buzz and excitement in the build-up to a brand new Bond film coming out, and then once that sheen has worn off the new film, and you come to it again, do you still like it or even dislike it as much as you did? I hadn't revisited No Time to Die in its entirety since my very big, long, in-depth review video that I released earlier this year. So I sat down to watch it, just in isolation. I didn't watch any of the other Craig films beforehand in preparation. I sat down, watched the 4K disc, and while I, 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 my, my comments about the film wouldn't have changed all that much over the year, where I would place it in my overall ranking of the series, I think, has. That is to say, I love a lot of elements about the film, the Cuba scenes, Craig's performance, the music, the pre-titles, all that wonderful, beautiful stuff, but I also really dislike a lot of elements, uh, mostly concerning some of the film's plotting, the massive contrivances it takes, the wishy-washy, never-quite-defined villain in Rami Malek, and the ending itself. A couple of days after seeing the film for the first time, I said this in one of my first videos about it. Come the ending, I'm just a bit confused and a bit uh, annoyed. Um, and yeah, I think it's, ooh, is it the worst <laughs> thing in any Bond film ever? I'm gonna get so many comments of people just telling me that I'm just some like, you know, pissed off fanboy. And maybe I am, but what can I do? And I'm sorry to say that I do still agree with my year younger self on that point. I really can't abide the ending and specifically the hoops that the script has to jump through to get Bond to that point. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. If you want to hear my thoughts in much more detail, then please do check out my in-depth review of that film. Yes, it's over two hours long. It's longer than most Bond films. So if my individual comments and opinions on the film haven't changed all that much, how could it possibly have slipped further down the ranking. Well, I do want to say that it is still like slap bang in the middle of the Craig entries for me. I would take Skyfall and Casino Royale over it and then below it I would put Spectre and Quantum of Solace. Previously I said that No Time to Die would sit in the middle of my overall Bond series rankings. But after my latest viewing, I think it might have even slipped as far into my bottom five. And to No Time to Die's credit, I feel like it, 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 I, I don't dislike the film anymore. But with this being the 60th anniversary of the Bond series overall, I've I've rewatched you know some of the other films and in different contexts and settings and whatnot, and I feel like my love of so much else in this series has just skyrocketed up. And I feel that if anything, I think No Time to Die might have made me appreciate and love some of those earlier Bond films even more. There are a couple in particular that, if you'd have asked me a year ago, I would have put No Time to Die above both of them, but now I'm like, no way! I mean, we are very lucky here in the UK that they have been screening all of the Bond films in cinemas, in order, and I've been to a handful, and there were a couple that really put No Time to Die into a different perspective for me, and those were License to Kill and God help me for saying this, but please wait around to hear my explanation, die another day. License to Kill I had a complete revelation with in general, seeing it on the big screen, but in relation to No Time to Die, both are so personal stories to Bond himself, and I feel like License to Kill handled the balance between the more fun elements you want from a Bond film with the more raw emotional stuff that Dalton was doing 
really well. In comparison, No Time to Die just seems a bit too overwrought and try-hard, particularly when Dalton's quiet few seconds of reflection at the end of his final Bond movie hit me with more emotion than Craig proclaiming his love for a woman and dying heroically at the end of his final Bond movie. And then, okay, let's talk about Dying of the Day. I've consistently ranked it low for years, and I'm not about to start claiming it's a great film, but damn if seeing it in the cinema again didn't transport me back in time to being that 13-year-old boy excited about seeing his first new Bond film on the big screen, and I had an absolute blast with it. Yes, it's very stupid, overblown, cheesy, it has that tsunami scene, but I enjoyed the thrill ride. I, it was fun hearing other audience members chuckle and groan in equal measure at some of the appalling one-liners. I came out of the cinema with a big, silly grin on my face. I'd had fun. Like, this Tuesday evening watching this ridiculous Bond film on the cinema screen, and I came out of the cinema feeling good. And I'm sorry to be so crass about this, but No Time to Die's ending, I, I, I think it is just the ultimate blue ball experience for me watching a Bond film. Those last few scenes just kill the whole experience for me, and I just come away from it every time feeling deflated, like I've had an 80% experience because the ending just isn't there. It just doesn't do anything for me, and it's the only Bond film like that, I think. Like, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the underwater climax and the fight on the boat in Thunderball, but that's the only other Bond film ending that I'd cite as really not being up my street. But No Time to Die is just another level. I, I'm just always tempted to turn the film off after the stairwell fight. So like I say, at one point or another I would have ranked No Time to Die above License to Kill, above Die Another Day. And now I just, I, I think it is because I'm in this 60th anniversary mentality for the series and I want to celebrate this character and this series and No Time to Die is a funeral, it's not a party. Another film that really helped me put No Time to Die into some perspective that I saw recently was Top Gun Maverick. Now I'm not one of the people who's gonna be singing the praises of that film you know, in, into the hills. Like, I, I think the first Top Gun is a perfectly fine film and I thought that Top Gun Maverick was a slightly better perfectly fine film, but nonetheless I went and saw it and I really enjoyed myself. It was a good bit of fun. It had an emotional story, it had characters with more invested in a situation than just a, a, a plot development or a MacGuffin or whatever, and I thought that it handled all of the various elements really well while still giving you this high octane really cool action all the way throughout. And I think that a lot of the really glowing like positive reception to that film has just been that particularly after the last two years that the world has been through, I think people just want to go to the cinema to have a you know, and come out feeling good about themselves and good about life in general. I'm not saying that a film needs to be this superficially happy, cheesy pop bubblegum thing. But uh, but I think Top Gun Maverick is a perfect example of this because there is an emotional story to it. There, there, there are a, a characters going through emotional troubles and whatnot, and it's just balanced really nicely and you still leave the cinema feeling, you leave the film feeling, feeling good. I do wonder if, obviously No Time to Die was filmed before the pandemic and all that kind of stuff, and I do wonder if they might have changed the ending to give people more of an uplift um, if, if it had come after the pandemic, or indeed if they were filming it during the pandemic. And as I say, this isn't about me pushing back against anything remotely emotional in a film, not the case at all. It's about the overwroughtness of what the emotional arc is in No Time to Die, when, like I say, uh, a couple of quiet seconds with just the camera on Timothy Dalton's face can move me significantly more than swelling music and this amazing cinematography and these actors tearing up and this dialogue and hearkening back to on Her Majesty's Secret Service and stuff. I find, I guess I, I find it slightly patronizing in that way. Ultimately, it is still that ending that I get hung up on because that's the taste that is left in my mouth after every time I watch it. And I don't know, maybe once the 60th anniversary is over, I'll be interested to revisit the film. I'll probably watch it another couple of times before the two year anniversary. I'd be interested to see if my opinions changed much more then. Or perhaps even when a new Bond has been announced and the wheels are really visibly getting moving on the next incarnation of Bond, because right now, 
uh, for, for an anniversary celebration movie, it kind of pales in comparison to, well, definitely Skyfall, and God help me, even, even, even that damn stupid film, <laughs> Die Another Day, that left me leaving the cinema with a damn stupid grin on my face, I have more fun watching that film than I do No Time to Die. Let me know your own thoughts about this in the comments section below. I'm really curious to see if there is a consensus on this. I've seen people talking about it on Twitter, and I think it's... I think... <sighs> I think it's kind of 50-50 in my experience from what I've seen. I know some people who, now that they're a bit more used to the ending and a bit more accepting of it, they really love the film. Equally, I know people who have revisited it, and the more times they revisit it, the more they see some flaws and just it, it, it slides down the rankings further. So let me know how it stands for you. And while you're down there, there's also the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification oh, button for those of you who want to stay super up to date on future video uploads. There's an array of links to my other social media pages. And with all that being said, so long for now, Bond fans.